Uh, my name is Jose Antonio Bowen, and I'm a senior fellow at the American Association of Colleges and Universities in the United States. So I've been thinking about technology for a long time, and technology has made a lot of new things possible. But I think the last place we want to use technology is in the classroom, because then it's just a kind of a poor substitute. So technology allows us to meet students where they are, at home, on their phone, on their computers. So I'm an advocate for using technology outside of the classroom. And the idea behind the Teaching Naked book or the Teaching Naked concept is that when we're with students face to face, we should primarily form relationships. We should do things that can only be done face to face and interactive. And one of those things is not lecturing that just standing and talking is something that can happen on a video. Now, that said, a stand and deliver video is also bad. That movies can do lots of things that theater cannot do. So I think what we should do with technology is do the things that only technology can do, but that technology does really, really well, and then do the things in the classroom that only people can do really, really well. So in, in American English, we've had the old three R's were content related. They were reading, writing, and arithmetic. They were the three things that were supposed to be the essential part of education. And they were all focused on content. My three R's are all focused on process. In other words, the process of thinking, of learning to change your mind, of, of learning how to think. And so those are relationships, resilience, and reflection. So relationships, because the first thing humans do is not listen to your facts. The first thing that humans do is decide if they trust you. It's about the relationship. It's about, do I think you're one of my people? People often think, oh, people get together with other people who think like them. But again, it's the opposite. People think like the people they hang out with. So we know one of the ways, if you want to change a student's mind, they need new friends that students who stay friends with their high school friends tend to keep their high school ideas. And students who make lots of new friends are more likely to create new ideas. Notice it has nothing to do with the quality of the professor. It has everything to do with who were the friends, what are the relationships. Number two is resilience. We know that learning is all about failure. So what happens when you fail? You can quit. If something is too hard, if I'm just going to quit. That's... So what we want is to build a system where students are resilient, that they continue to try. When they make a mistake, they do something again. And so that's a structural issue. For education, if we want students to take what they've, the content they've learned and to think, I need to change my mind, or I need to adapt to new circumstances or new facts, or that's not relevant, we need to give students a chance to reflect. What we tend to do is to give students content, lots of content, more information. But we never stop to say, well, does that content change your mind? Which pieces of those content made you change your assumptions? So in teaching, we've got to spend a lot more time designing and building spaces for reflection so that students will actually take the time to take the content and to think about how it adjusts the things that they already knew. Because that's really the point of teaching, is to change students, to have them think, I thought I knew this, this is a fact, but now I've learned this new fact, and I have to adapt what I used to think. And that's reflection. So relationships, resilience, and reflection, I think, are the core principles of good teaching, especially in an age where you can get more content on the internet than you could ever get before. So we shouldn't be focusing on just content. We should focus on the process of learning to change your mind. So content is not going away. Content is important. Humans think in specific, not in the abstract. So we need content. But if you say, well, what do I do in my course? Most people think, well, I deliver this content. I have to make sure they know A, B, and C by the end of the semester. 
That's important. But, I, but we also say, well, I want them to think and I want them to think like a historian. I want them to understand what biology really is and why it's important. But we spend 99% of our time talking about content and very little time talking about process. So I don't want to eliminate our conversations about content, but I want us to change the balance. I want us to take a more balanced approach so that we spend more time integrating that content into their thinking and talking about the process of what is it like to be a biologist? What is it like when you get new in information? What is it like when your experiment turns out to be wrong? and you didn't get the answer that you thought you were going to get. We need to spend more time on process and less just on content. So typically, our evaluations are all based on content. We want to know what, has a what facts has a student learned during the semester. That can be useful, but we tend not to measure how students' thinking has changed, partly because it's a little harder. Okay, so why do we spend all of our time doing what's easiest rather than what's hardest? What's hardest is also more important. So I'd like us to think about ways that may be imperfect, but ways of measuring and, and, and evaluating what students have actually changed in their thinking. So I typically ask a student at the end of the semester, what did you learn to love in my class? And I tell them at the beginning that that is going to be the question on the last exam. What did you learn to love? So now they're puzzled, but they spend the semester asking different questions. And so by the time they get to the end, they can all provide me with an answer. So I don't care that they all get the answer right because that's what I wanted. I want all my students to succeed. So frankly, I'm less interested in sorting students, right? High achiever, low achiever. I understand the need for that, but I'm much more interested in creating lifelong learners, creating motivated learners who want to go out and learn new things. Because the reality is I can't teach them. None of us can teach them what they really need to know for the future. The future is unknown. What they need to know in 20 years hasn't been discovered. A degree in computer science is still a degree in the iPhone 12 or 13. It's not a degree in the iPhone 20 because it hasn't yet been invented. So we need students who can learn new things. And so I want us to evaluate their ability to do that, to learn new things, and not just how much content they, they have absorbed about the past because that content will be less useful in 20 years. Well, so the most motivating thing for most students is are things relevant, right? Is this gonna work? For, am I gonna be able to get a job with this? Is this a real skill? And so a lot of what we teach does relate to things people will do in the workplace. We just don't take the time to make the connection with students that this is what you're going to do if you want to make a living. Part of that's because a lot of professors have not spent a lot of time in the workforce, but thinking about those connections is very motivating to students. Motivation can be a little thing, like do you know a relative who has this problem? Are you going to have patients who might be helped by this technique? That little reminders, they have to be constant, but little reminders about the connection between what we're studying and how it will help you in the future really do improve student motivation. So the field of economics has been transformed, even a Nobel Prize, to this idea of behavioral economics. So economists, like teachers, have tended to think that students were rational and that they would do things rationally. So if the price falls, people will buy more, et cetera. But it turns out, of course, people are not rational, that they are emotional. Uh, and so people do things that feel good. Uh, and so nudges is the idea that if, you, if I have two things to do, one is the default, like if I, I take a new job and the default is I don't have a retirement plan, I have to go to the office to check, yes, I want a retirement plan, fewer people do it. Because again, rationally, do I know I need a retirement plan? Yes, but do I want the hassle of going to the HR office? No. So if I change the default to you're enrolled automatically, you have to unenroll, then more people do a retirement plan. 
So that same idea of nudges that's being used by governments, by economists, by every, you know, banks, advertisers, you see us all around us, it can also work in higher education. So instead of saying to students, do you want to get emails about financial aid or when your assignment isn't done? You're going to get emails about when your assignments are due unless you check the box that says no, that's a nudge. Or if I send you a text and I say, there's a, there's a review session on Wednesday. There's a review session on Wednesday and 70% of the students who went last year said it was really good. That's a nudge and that actually changes the participation of students who then come to the review session. So it's about understanding how human motivation really works. So the same techniques that work in the rest of the world will also work in the classroom. As, a, as an administrator, the, always the most important thing is how do you help faculty and students make change, make a difference? And so uh, while I was president at Goucher, we were able to do a new curriculum that was not based on content. It was actually based on process. Now, I didn't do it. I, the faculty did it. My job was to create the space where people could say and, and to provide motivation and encouragement for thinking about things in new ways. But we actually created a curriculum for the, a university curriculum that was based upon solving complex problems over a series of four years rather than, well, I've got to take an anthropology course and a science course and an English course and the usual sorts of check boxes. They had to end up taking all those things. But the idea was that we were actually living our values. And I think people just want an opportunity to do that. And there's so many obstacles. There's so much bureaucracy. There's so many things in the way. And so my job as an administrator is to make things possible, to reduce bureaucracy, to remove obstacles, to make it possible for people to live their values. So my most memorable experience, unfortunately, was, is, was a bad one. But I remember my first day of college vividly. Uh, so I'm new to college and uh, I went to History 101 with a, with a friend. Her name was Cricket. I'd never met anybody with a name like that. So we had the same class together, nine o'clock in the morning, we're sitting in class. And the teacher walks out and says, today we are gonna study the three A's. And my friend Cricket, looks at me and rolls her eyes and goes, ah, again. And I, I said, I've never heard of the three A's. Wh what is this, who are they? And she rolls her eyes like only a teenager could do and says, Aristotle, Augustine, and Aquinas, duh. And I feel about this big. And I realized that the teacher, while not intending to make me feel inadequate, had made me feel like a total outsider in the first five minutes of college. And it took me years to, to, to recover from that. Literally, I, I, mean, I felt like, an, like, I didn't, like I was not prepared and my friend was much more prepared. You know, she knew who the three A's were. So that made me think about how, right, she was gonna do fine, the top half of the class is fine. And so I, 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 I think about what is the thing that somebody's not gonna know that I assume I know because I live here all the time and how can I make it easier for that person who's new or who's feeling nervous? How can I make them feel more at home in my classroom? Because that's essential to learning, is that sense of belonging. Well, Valencia is a great city. Intet is a great conference. I've met lots of wonderful people from all over the world. It's a wonderful thing to meet people with very different experiences from different countries uh, and to share ideas. We learn a lot from each other. It's really been a fabulous conference.